All right, everybody. Welcome to the 2020 Candidate Forum for District 11 of the Ohio State Board of Education. My name is Wendy During, and I will be moderating our program this evening. I would like to thank all of you for making a concerted effort to become fully informed voters. Local and state government has a major and direct impact on our daily lives, but it often receives little attention. This forum is being sponsored by the League of Women Voters, a truly nonpartisan political organization recognized for its impartiality and respected role in promoting informed and active participation in government and advocating for good government policies. We celebrate our 100th anniversary this year. The League is valued by both voters and candidates and elected officials because it insists upon and makes possible the fair exchange and expression of views upon which our democracy depends. The work that the League does is made possible by member dues and donations and the dedication of League volunteers. If you are not a member, we encourage you to join. Membership forms can be found online at our website, which is lwvgreatercleveland.org, all one word. I would like to thank Michael Barron, who has organized this forum along with many of the forums that we sponsor, and also Brad Owens of the Hey Shaker podcast for coordinating the technical side of this evening. The recording of this forum will be made available on the LWVGC website's link to our YouTube channel. We've also received assistance in understanding issues of education in Ohio from our very own Susie Kayser, who is currently serving as the education specialist for the League of Women Voters of Ohio. This is a forum to hear from the three candidates who are seeking election to District 11 of the State Board of Education. The State Board of Education has 19 nonpartisan members, 11 of them elected to four-year terms and eight of them appointed by the governor and approved by the Ohio Senate. Each of the 11 elected districts represents contiguous areas of the state with District 11, including I believe most of Cuyahoga County and a small portion of Lake County. Before we begin tonight's forum, we have a few rules. Each candidate will have, a two, will have two minutes for an opening statement and two minutes for a closing statement after a question and answer period. Time limits will be enforced. Our timer clock will be visible as you can see. Uh, it'd be visible to the candidates on the screen. Only written questions will be accepted. If you would like to submit a question for the candidates during the live forum, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. League screeners will review submitted questions. This is not to block opinions or skew information, but in order to avoid duplication, provide a diversity of questions and ensure readability and appropriateness. To quote Thomas Jefferson, Information is the currency of democracy. May you all be enriched by your participation here tonight. The order of speaking has been determined by drawing lots and it will be reversed then for the closing statements. And I'll explain the ordering during the, the question answer period. Uh, our three candidates in order of speaking this evening are Rocky Neal, followed by Michelle Elba, followed by Merrill Johnson. So our first opening statement is from Rocky Neal. You can go ahead. First, I'd like to thank everybody for being here this evening. I would like to introduce myself. I am a uh, lifetime Westside gentleman. Grew up at grew up and went to James Ford Rhodes High School, Charles A. a. Mooney Middle School. Um, I am a married man of 35 years. Next month, I have two kids, two granddaughters. I've been on the Brooklyn City School Board for 12 years. I was the president of the Brooklyn City School Board for six years. Um, I also officiate high school football. I've been doing that for 15 or 16 years. I really enjoy that. A little cool weather, but we'll get through it. Um, and I'm just passionate about the school. I enjoy, I, I got in, how I got started in this was I volunteered on the bus as a, as a student aide. And one thing led to another. I volunteered to help coach basketball, volunteered to help coach football. Next thing I know, the position opened, I got appointed, and I ran for several years. I've been on the school, like I said, I've been on the school board for 12 years. Uh, there were a couple of years that I missed because I do have a job where I have to create my own income, and I had to take a couple of years off just to make sure I get that going in the right direction. So I'm excited about this evening. I'm looking forward to it. 
I said my my leadership and my experience I think will give me you know it gives me some uh, platitude of moving forward and doing this and doing a good job for the state. I think reaching out to the state and and being involved with it will just I think I think I can help that. So I just want to thank everybody for allowing me to be on be on the uh, candidates uh, ballot. Alrighty. Thank you, Mr. Neal. Ms. Zelda, your opening statement. Thank you so much and congratulations for your 100th year. I'm Michelle Alba. I am seeking the position of state school board for District 11. I have served on my local school board in Warrensville Heights for eight years and the Northeast Regional Executive Committee for four. I too got started as a volunteer. I was the PTO president for 15 years and a PTO member for 10. I was a school board president for two years I have been going to Washington DC and to Columbus for the last six years advocating for public education. I am a widow of five years. I have two daughters. One is a recent college graduate and the other is in her final year of college. And I too wanted to bring something to the school district. I wanted to make sure that all schools, all students get equity and equality education um, in Ohio. So I really just like to thank you for allowing me to come on and speak to continue to advocate for our students and parents. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Elba. And Ms. Johnson. Thank you. First, thank you to the League of Women Voters for having this very important forum and for all the work that you do. Uh, my name is Merle Johnson. I am presently a member of the State Board of Education, so I am the incumbent. Uh, I taught in Cleveland schools for 40 years and I was director of uh, community engagement for the Cleveland Teachers Union for 26 years. During my 19th year of teaching, there was a lawsuit filed on behalf of a young 15-year-old student entering high school named Nathan DeRolf. And that lawsuit was filed because of the lack of thorough and efficient education in Ohio, uh, which led to a serious inequity in our state. That inequity is what really drives me as far as fighting for our young people. Um, the Ohio Supreme Court ruled four times in 1997, 2000, 2001, and 2002 that the way Ohio funds its schools is unconstitutional because of the over-reliance on property taxes, which creates a system in which students, the students' quality of education is determined by their zip code. So because of that, we have a number of problems in this state uh, which is no fault of the students or the parents of those students. And so I am very concerned about it. That's why I ran four years ago. And that's why I am seeking reelection because I wanna to continue to fight for the 1.8 million students in this state so that we can try to make sure they have a quality of education they deserve in spite of the lack of equity, which still has not been acted upon uh, by the legislature. So I just like to say um, thank you for allowing me to be here, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. We're now entering the question and answer period. Um, you will have one minute, up to one minute, to answer the question. Each of you will get the same question, uh, unless there is a question that is really specifically directed to someone. Um, my process is to keep rotating. I always go in the same order, so you know when you're up next, but the first person to answer each question rotates. So you get the hot seat one, one question for, for answering it first, um, and then you'll, you'll get to be the last one, so you'll have you know, more time um, to formulate your answers. All right, um, so starting uh, question one, I will use the same order that we just had, so starting with Mr. Neal and so on. Um, and one minute for your answers. Public education has long been seen as the cornerstone of our democracy. Please articulate what you believe to be the purpose of public education and what makes it a democratic institution. Please articulate. I want to, um, gosh. Why is it important to our democracy? It, or is it? It, it, it creates, it creates, uh, how can I say this? You got me on this one. <laughs> Why is it important to our democracy? Because we need education to get better jobs, create better jobs, create better people in general. So that's really the cornerstone of our education is creating better human beings 
that can create themselves as better people. So that's the way I look at it. Education is important. Okay. Ms. Alba. So I, I too believe um, what Mr. Neal said. Um, I think um, education is our cornerstone and we want to, I believe as far as, we wanted to make sure that all students receive the education, whether they wanted to go on to college or into the workforce. And without the education, everyone will become at a standstill. Education is truly important as where when I was in school, a high school diploma was the thing to have in order to get a decent, well-paying job to be self-sufficient in the United States. Now it's almost, almost a further education or a trade. So education is the foundation for everything. And it actually starts within a mother's womb. And that's my opinion. Thank you, Ms. Oliver. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. I believe the uh, purpose of education is to prepare young people um, for the world that they're going to live in so that they're not stuck in uh, low wage jobs. I think it's also important. Uh, the purpose of education is to prepare young people to be critical thinkers, uh, to be problem solvers, to be good citizens so that they can participate in our democracy. Uh, and once they become those problem solvers, then hopefully they can begin to solve the problems that we haven't been able to solve. Thank you. All right, so Michelle Elba, you'll have the first answer on this next question. Uh, historically, public funds were always reserved for the public schools. What is your view on the current use of public funds to pay for private education through things like vouchers and bus, um, busing the students um, and, and some other things? Uh, if a private education provider receives public funds, should they be held to the same standards as public schools? Should they be subject to oversight by the State Department of Education? So I do believe that all schools, public charter and private schools should be held to the same standards. I do not believe that funds should be taken away from public education for private or charter. I think that there needs to be a separate funding for that um, because when you start taking away from public education, something is going to lack. Uh, and so that's something that we don't wanna happen because everyone can't afford to take advantage of the private education um, that is being offered. And what was your final part of the question? I know it was a three part. Um, should they be, should the private schools and charter schools be subject to oversight by the State Department of Education? Absolutely. I think that everyone needs to be held accountable. Um, if we're gonna hold our students and parents accountable, I believe that everyone from teachers all up to administrators to board members, everyone should be held accountable and held to the same standards to ensure the education is uh, across the board. Very good, thank you. Ms. Johnson, same question. Uh, yes, I agree with uh, Ms. Elba. I do not believe that public tax dollars should be used for religious or private schools. I know you didn't say religious, but they are used for that. And um, I think that's one of the major problems in this state. Uh, we, we have a system uh, of legislators that uh, underfunded um, our public schools, and then they decided to take money from those underfunded schools to create another school system of charter schools and, and to allow students to leave public schools to go to private religious schools. And at the same time, our neediest students, it's really affecting our neediest students in this state. They're the ones that are having this money taken away from their districts. So I think it's wrong. I think there should be a separate, as Ms. Elba said, I think that these um, uh, vouchers and charters should be directly funded by the state and the money should not be taken uh, from the um, charter schools, excuse me, it should not be taken from the district. But the major problem is that the students, number of students who are getting the vouchers have never attended public schools. And so the Thank problem you. is out of control. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Neal. Coming from a district where we're a cap district, uh, Brooklyn City Schools has always lacked proper funding. We're always on the levy. Um, out of the 611 schools, there's 611 districts, 26 cap districts, and we are one of those districts. So it is a tough thing to do to rely on the property taxes. Mm -hmm. um, we just passed a levy two years ago that got us new money to get us over the top. So as far as uh, uh, charter schools and I don't think there's a way that, we gotta figure out a way to do this. There's a better way 
to figure out how we can fund schools. That's all I can tell you right now is uh, we need some help with that. And as far as the charter schools and the vouchers, I'm willing to listen. Let's put it that way. I'm willing to listen to some. I, I think we need to th get some smart people and put them, throw everybody into the pot and start talking about this stuff, figure out the best way to do this. All right, thank you very much. Um, my cat has dropped in. Um, <laughs> uh, the State Board of Education is responsible for monitoring and reporting to the public about the status of public education, primarily through the use of testing. How satisfied are you with Ohio's current testing program and its uses? Uh, starting with Ms. Johnson. Um, thank you for the question. The reason I started off giving that little history lesson about the um, Duroff case is because even though the students, uh, the quality of their education is determined by their zip code, which is wrong, all the students are evaluated on the same test. And that makes it even worse, mainly because our testing now, it measures wealth instead of intelligence because of how our schools are funded. So I do not believe that our uh, testing system is appropriate. I don't think, first of all, I don't think that students should just be evaluated through a test. Um, there are other ways to evaluate students. And when you use the same test to evaluate students in an inequitable state like Ohio, um, then you do not get a true uh, uh, measure of, of the quality of the schools or the district or what the student is doing. So I do not uh, believe that our uh, testing system is what it should be. Thank you. Mr. Neal. I, I, I agree with Mr. Johnson, to be honest. We do need to do some work on that. Um, I think the report card is changed by every governor, every change of uh, administration sometimes. So I believe that it does need, a, need some more consistency and it does need some more common sense as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Ms. Elba. Um, no, I don't think the state testing is fair. Um, I think that there needs to be a, a way and a standard to hold our students accountable to ensure that they are ready to graduate. I think that unfortunately, because the test has changed so often, you find most school districts actually teaching the test and not teaching the grade, which becomes problematic and a struggle for the staff as well as for the parents as well as for the students, because once that's over, then what has the child learned or the student learned? So I think there needs to be a better way. I think we need to add more people that has a say in it. We need to be looking at if we're going to add teachers from all aspects, from urban as well as suburban school districts, um, to make sure that everyone is adequately trained on how to test and making sure that the questions are geared towards all students and not just a certain class of students. Thank you. So if not testing, then what information should the State Board of Education collect, analyze, and report so that the policymakers and residents of Ohio can evaluate if schools that receive public funds are serving the students in the communities? What type of information? Yeah. What would validate the, what would show the validity of the schools, the effectiveness of the schools other than testing? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where you could go with that, with uh, validate, you know, without testing. Um, that's a tough one. Without testing, you got to have some gauge. You know what? I, I, I'm, I'm sort of dumbfounded on that one. Um, you need to give the, that's a tough one. Without testing, what do you give to the state? I'm not sure, to be quite honest. Well, given that the state continually relies on testing, there, there may not be a, a good answer, but we'll see if um, yeah. Ms. Alba or yeah, Ms. Johnson have any ideas. Yeah, I'm not sure what you can give to them if you, if you, if you don't have <laughs> testing, even though we have to change some of the tests or make them more common sense. That's my opinion. <laughs> okay. Ms. Alba? Well, I think there needs to be some form of accountability. Um, I think testing is okay as long as that it just not determine if a student graduates or not, because every student is not a test taker. 
I think that if we're going to look at things, we need to look at the student overall. We need to look at their academics, how they're performing throughout the year. We need to look at other things other than just one particular tool of testing, um, because testing is not just about a student. I mean, you have students that are in college that don't test well. It doesn't mean that they're not college material. It just means that they need the more extra help. So I think if we are going to hold everyone accountable, I think that the test should just not be the major tool to determine graduation. Thank you. And Ms. Johnson. In a, in a book called The Testing Charade by Daniel Koretz, he <laughs> said something, and I'm paraphrasing, because I don't have it in front of me. He says something like, um, if testing isn't the problem. It depends on how you're using the test. And in Ohio, um, not good decisions have not been made on how you use the test as far as state takeovers and a report card that is not a valid instrument to measure. So there are other ways to measure progress besides tests. Uh, you know, you could use um, uh, pro capstone projects. Uh, you could look at um, the child's ability to problem solve. You can do group work. You can do all kinds of other ways to evaluate how schools are doing besides just testing. Um, so, you know, we don't need to rely on a test to be able to evaluate or measure how well a district or a school is doing. There are other ways to evaluate um, the quality of, of, of what's going on in the state. Thank you. Um, next question to Ms. Zelba. Um, and also, I have a, I, I'm getting questions from um, the, the audience. Um, so, trying to, to take care of both here. Um, the State Board recently reiterated their commitment to equity in a resolution that identified equity as thoughtful teaching of future citizens that racism, bigotry, and hatred have no place. Please comment on your understanding of equity in our public schools and what could perhaps be done to address it. Ms. Elba. So I think that when we create policies, we need to make sure that they are being followed up and followed through. Too many times, um, policies are created and they look good on paper, but sometimes they fall through the cracks. And as far as the equity is concerned, we need to make sure that all school districts, no matter where you are at in Ohio, that you are receiving the same tools, the same resources, the same education. Just because you live in a certain area, you should not get more or less because those kids are, are still kids. They're still kids. They're still gonna need the same quality education to be successful, to be self-sufficient once they leave school to go out into the real world. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Um, I um, believe that Ms. Ms. Elba was talking about um, equality and I wanna talk about equity. Um, equity is when you provide what a child needs. Everybody shouldn't get the same because everyone's needs are not the same. Uh, some have more challenges than others. Uh, so, so equity work is about compensating for those challenges. Uh, we have to draw on those who have more privilege to help those who have less privilege. I was one of the developers of the uh, our resolution uh, at the state board level. I'm very proud of it. And, um, and so I wanna say that when you talk about equity, it's making sure that you provide resources for those who are the neediest. And, and that's what should be going on in the state. And right now, that's not happening. Mr. Uh, Mr. Neal. I will. I believe the equity should be equal as well, too. Um, there are kids out there that, again, need help. I came from the special needs end of it. So from every aspect, that's what needs to be done is just be equitable, uh, financial, education for all, of, all the kids. Okay, thank you. Ms. Johnson. Um, should the uh, state school board increase its influence on school policy? And if so, how can they do that? Um, 
Well, when you say should we inf increase our influence, we can't increase it by ourselves because the final word is usually in the legislature. So the state school board really makes recommendations uh, to the legislature. I, you know, having been on the board for four years, I, I can't really think of how we could increase our influence. I think the, the 11 elect, elected members, our influence is in the community. And so when you talk about increasing our influence, I think that is happens in convening members of the community and making sure that we do our job to educate them on what's going on at the state board level. Um, but I don't, I, it seems like it would be a challenge to increase our influence because most of 95% of what we do ends up in the hands of the legislature and they are the ones who um, make the final decision about most of the work that we do. Thank you. Um, Mr. Neal. I agree the board members only have so much power. Um, elected officials only have so much power it has to be handed down to to the to the legislator and the board members just can create but they can't vote and put it into motion so that's where it stands okay and ms johnson i already answered oh, I'm, I'm, um sorry ms elba so I believe that because it is passed over to the legislation, that's where we start holding our voters accountable. We make sure that if there's gonna be policies that are gonna be put in place for our students, then just like we would hold anyone else accountable, then we need to make sure that we go to the polls, that we hold our legislators accountable to make sure that our students all are educated and not just sit on it. You know, you can only do so much as a board member. Board members, uh, you can speak for yourself. You just can't speak for the whole entire team. But collectively, if you get together, there needs to be some type of action that go to move forward. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Neal, hope I'm keeping this straight. Um, the State Board of Education recently passed a resolution stating that the local school leader <coughs> and health officials are in the best position to plan how to deliver education during the pandemic. What role, if any, should the state board play in guaranteeing that education is safe and adequate during this time? I believe the state board level should probably go along with the state board of health, in my opinion. And I don't see much more other than that. Um, make, they can make some recommendations, but they have to listen to the state board of health and the governor from my, from my understanding as well too. Okay, Ms. Alba. Well, I agree with Mr. Neal um, that whatever the Department of Health, the State Department of Health is following those guidelines that they're setting out for the, the Ohio in general, I think that the board needs to follow those as well because we have, we're putting people's lives in, in harm's way, if you will, but we also need to make sure that our students are educated. And right now there appears to be a huge struggle with remote learning. And so we need to find a better way to continue to educate as well as keep our students and teachers safe. Because it's not just our students, it's our teachers, it's our administrators that we all need to keep safe during this time. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Um, thank you. Um, one of the things that I personally did, those who follow me on Facebook know that I uh, was responsible for making sure that information from the reset and restart guide that was developed by the governor's office and by the Department of Education, uh, I made sure that information from that reset and restart was, was shared uh, with people on Facebook and with my constituents um, in, in the communities in which I represent. And so I thought that was a really, really important sharing of information because there were a lot of um, things in the, in the reset and restart guide that some people on Facebook said they really um, appreciated receiving the information. Um, so that's one of the things that I think that we can do, but also just staying in touch with the parents in our district and with the students and sharing issues that they may be having, sharing them directly with the state board members so that we can begin to try to solve some of those problems. Okay, very good. Um, Ms. Elba. <coughs> Reading and arithmetic continue to be a problem. 
would it not be wiser to have these subjects thoroughly taught and then add more, uh, more complex learning once the students can read and understand? And so the emphasis on social issues or other things. Well, I think all subjects are important. I think that um, we have gotten away from phonics. And I think that that is the foundation. Phonics needs to start in pre-K or Head Start, wherever your child starts first. If they start in kindergarten, then phonics needs to start begin there. Because if you don't have the grasping of the letters, then it, you're gonna have a constant struggle throughout the entire time. So I think all subjects are important. It's just a matter of in what state that they start in, but I don't think that anything should ever be removed. Um, I think it was a disservice that we removed cursive writing from the school districts because in college and in life, you do cursive writing, not too many places allow printing. So I think that we need to get back to our basics as far as teaching our kids to make sure that they receive the foundation to move forward. Thank you. Um, I've lost track of my round robin. Um, I started that with, uh, okay, um, Ms. Johnson. I apologize, could you repeat the question? I was. I was reading the, the chat and, and I kind of <laughs> lost focus um, on the question. It, <laughs> I, I, I understand. Well, and, and I have um, moved on. Um, that reading and arithmetic continue to be a problem. Would it not be wiser to have these subjects more thoroughly taught and then add more complex learning once the students can read and understand? You know, I don't, I don't really understand that question. It says reading and arithmetic seem to continue to be a problem. So then we teach them until you know, the students understand what they should be learning. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what that means. I think as opposed to all of the other ancillary subjects that people think are, are being taught in schools or the other places that time is being spent. Okay, I've, I've never met an unimportant subject. So um, I think that when you talk about the whole child and the child being well-rounded, um, I think all subjects are important. So we just have to find a way. And that's one of the things that's wrong with testing is music and art and the non-tested subjects were eliminated. That's why cursive writing was eliminated to make more room for test prep. So I think we have to have room for all the subjects that are gonna create that whole child and make sure that our young people are well-rounded. Thank you, Mr. Neal. I believe you have to have a foundation and I think it starts with the reading and the writing and the arithmetic. I know that there are kids in the high school level that can't balance a checkbook. And I think that's most important is some of the basics. And that's what we've gotten away from. We brought, into, we brought subjects in that take away from some of the basics. And I think it's important that we bring that uh, foundation back from pre-K through 12. It needs to be brought back. And I've used this term already this evening, common sense, some basic stuff. Reading, writing, and arithmetic is very important. Uh, how do we get paid? Some kids don't even know how they get paid or how much they're going to make when they leave high school and have a job. So I think common sense, there's got to be a foundation built in. So, all righty. I did actually have an envelope returned to me from the post office asking me to please print, and it was very legible cursive handwriting. So that Surprise me. Um, yeah. uh, let me see, I had a question picked out here. Um, we're being asked from the audience, um, what powers does the Board of Education have um, and why is the, the Board of Education important? Why do the candidates State matter? State Board of Education or the State, Edu board, of, State, State board of Education. Um, starting with Ms. Johnson, I understand there are multiple responsibilities, so don't take all of them, please, Ms. Johnson. Leave some for your, your co-candidates here. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to say one, I think one of the most important things that the State Board of Education does is that we, uh, we make sure that the standards are what they should be. Um, they come through the committees, the, the Teaching, Leading, and Learning Committee, and we go through them. We go through the model curriculum. Um, and we look at it very carefully, uh, make sure that um, the standards are what they should be. And, you know, and I really appreciate that part too and, and being able to um, ask questions and to see if the standards are really fair and if we think that they're asking of the students what should be asked of them. 
So I think that's one of the one of the most important things that we do is that we really look very closely at the at the state standards. Thank you, Mr. Neal. Can you repeat that question again? I'm sorry. I can. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Um, it's a challenge for me to remember what I just asked. Uh, what are the specific powers and duties of the state board? Why does the state board of education matter? Well, it, it creates the policies that drive the rest of the districts. Um, like Mrs. Johnson said, the standardized stuff that comes to the table needs to be broken down. So that, that's really what it does. It creates the standardized stuff to bring to the table for the other districts to fan them out. Okay, and Ms. Alba. Um, they are about establishing policy and recommendations to direct the superintendent to advocate for the education. They uh, have a committee that creates a budget and a timeline that is forwarded on to the state board for and the general assembly for recommendations for passing of these policies. Um, all the policies that are looked at in the beginning, they're actually a direction for our local school boards. So no one board member can do it alone. You need all 19, just like on the local board, you need all five or all seven. I think that question is important because a lot of people really don't know about the State Board of Education and they're frankly surprised when they see it on the ballot. So I can I can add more, but you said Ms. Johnson, don't take all of it. So I only mentioned <laughs> one thing. In the interest of education, go ahead and um, now that everyone else has minute. spoken, I will say more. Sure. <laughs> but but um, we do set policy. Um, I think it's also very important to know that we um, we do license appeals when 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 someone um, has allegedly done something that they shouldn't have done, um, we're the last stop. Uh, the, it comes to us and we read a lot of material and um, make a decision on if we agree with what the hearing officer has recommended or if we want to take a different direction. Um, we also hire and or fire the state superintendent. So um, I, I consider that to also to be a very important um, role uh, the state superintendent we have right now, I think is, is excellent. I'm glad we have him, uh, but that's also another uh, important uh, job that the State Board of Education has. Thank you. Uh, there's a, a scroll bar for the questions and I, it's uh, not always cooperating for me. Um, What tools do we, as, uh, starting with Mr. Neal first, what tools do we need in order to evaluate the performance of the schools? What tools do we need to, in order to evaluate? We kind of now, touched on this earlier, but. We're, we're gonna go back to testing in order to evaluate it. So uh, we need to create a better testing platform um, to some extent. Um, as far as the report card goes, is that a tool? I'm not sure. We need to, uh, uh, the report card's been so inconsistent in my opinion over the years that I've been on the board uh, that we need to straighten that out as far as the tools go. Um, as far as the tools go, um, I'm not sure we were, what we could use for that one. The report card is the tool that we look at in order to look at the education of kids. Okay, Ms. Elba. Well, in addition to the state testing that we have that we need to all agree, we've all agreed that it is not working and that we need to find a better way. But I think that we need to look at the districts itself, itself in a general, um, because just because a district performs not so well on a testing does not mean that that district is not thriving in other areas. Um, our students are thriving in other areas, but we just don't always see it because we're so focused on the test. I think that we need to start looking at the individual districts and see what they are doing that they have improved and what are they working on. And if there is a deficit in anything in the district, then how do we work with them other than through our state, bless you, our state schools to continue to uplift them and provide them the tools that they need to ensure that those students stay afloat. 
Yeah, thank you. And Ms. Johnson. Um, I, I really like that question because it's it puts me in mind of something that we should have been doing a long time ago. And that's having a conversation with parents as to what they consider important about their school. And once we have that answer, then we take a look at how we measure it. Um, I think especially schools that are um, low income and in, in, in not so wealthy districts, I would take a look at a tool that could measure the quality of the wraparound services they're using. Um, I would look at after school tools to measure after school activities. I would say use the students as a tool. Student surveys have been known to be very, um, uh, very uh, effective. And because as far as I'm concerned, if the students aren't happy, then we need to take a look at what's going on in the school. So when you talk about tools, I think we need to have conversations with the stakeholders and, and say, you know, what is it that you really want your school to produce? What would, what for you, what do you think would be a good way to measure what's happening in your school? Testing is not, you know, there are some students who would be fine with tests, but testing, I think it's more to look at student growth as opposed to, can you fill in this bubble or can you do A, B, or C? So student growth, Thank you. Thank you, but not value, not value added. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a question here about uh, basically about curriculum. Um, uh, the, the recent suggestion that history curriculum should be changed um, to, to a more patriotic curriculum. Um, how does curriculum get set? Uh, is it set by the state? Is it set by the um, Board of Education? What do you feel about influences on the, um, on the curriculum as it stands currently, uh, Ms. Elba? So the curriculum, I think as far as history, I think that students need to learn all parts of history, not just their own history, um, because it didn't just begin with one particular race. So mm -hmm. I think that moving forward, if all possible, which I know it takes time, but uh, I think that we need to once again, go back to a foundation of educating and teaching all types of history. I don't think that that's something that should ever be removed because we all still must learn our history. Even now, you know, you still have to learn your history. You have to learn where you come from. You need to learn where you come from in order to know where you're going. Okay, thank you. Ms. Johnson. Um, I think it's important that students be taught the truth. And there are, there's a segment of people in this country who want students to be taught history as if America was wonderful and did nothing wrong. And that's the problem. We heard from a number of those speakers at our last month's board meeting. Um, they need to be taught the truth. It may not be pretty, but they, they need to, to recognize that um, this country has done some horrible things to people. And that needs to be a part of, of what is taught in history. They need to be taught that there was, there was resistance that, that people of color, that African-Americans didn't just accept everything that was happening. And especially when reconstruction is taught in schools, um, that doesn't get covered the way it should. So my short answer is teach the truth about America in, in history classes. Thank you. Mr. Neal. I think we all need to know our history and our genealogy as well too, to find out where we, where we came from and where we went forward. As far as uh, moving forward, I think we all need to learn our, the question I got from Ms. Johnson is where, where, who, who has the truth or where, you know, where do we get the factual stuff from? And I'm not opposed to whoever, whoever, but I just want to know where, where we started. That's the problem. I, you know, I mean, going forward, we need to find out where the facts are as well, too. So that's it. I think that's where the history starts. Who can we trust? Okay. Ms. Johnson, new question. Um, there's a lot of, uh, every community has their own school district, their own board of education, uh, their own policies. Um, there's, there've been efforts to uh, regionalize city governments, community governments. Do you have an opinion on 
the idea of regionalizing schools to combine multiple districts in the interest of saving money and providing greater consistency and resources. Um, I think we need to figure out how to do a good job with what we have right now. Um, and in, in the question that you just asked, um, curriculum is, is the responsibility of the local districts. So the State Board of Education has no control over an individual district's curriculum. I just need to say that. Uh, we deal with standards, local districts deal with the curriculum. But as far as regionalization, no, we need to, we need to figure out how to do what we need to do well in, in the districts of 609 or 610 districts that we are in right now. Then when we have it right, I would say you can explore something else, but, but not until. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Neal. As far as regionalization, I'm not aware of any. I know Cleveland Heights University Heights has a working relationship and I know Brooklyn, we have a work, working relationship with the city, the Parma School District do our transportation. As far as regional education, I don't think we should need, need to go there at this time, but I think you could do some things together regionally as far as working together on some other platitudes as far as the transportation and that type of stuff. Okay, Ms. Elba. I think we need to leave it alone the way it is. Um, I think you need to, we need to allow each school district to focus on their strengths and their challenges um, before we can even create another, another challenge. Let's focus on what we have right now. I do think that, um, like Mr. Neely said, if there wanted to be some type of partnership of sharing of transportation or something to that effect, then maybe so, or if maybe small school districts wanted to share treasures or share superintendents, uh, we, we've all seen that happen, but not, not redistricting and, and combining school districts at this time. All right, um, Mr. Neal. I just lost my question. Um, adequate and equitable funding remains unsolved, remain unsolved challenges for public education in Ohio and the pandemic has created new costs for the schools while depressing state general fund revenues. What would you suggest as the priorities for the use of Ohio's scarce education resources at this difficult moment? Well, I know that what we've just used is the CARE funding to clean up all the schools, get them all ready for you know, the young kids coming back. We just opened our hybrid um, in Brooklyn just recently this past Monday. So I think a lot of that money is used for that. And uh, it becomes very uh, costly at times. So. You know, I, what was the first part of this, this question? I'm sorry. Um, that funding um, funding is, is always a challenge for the schools and now the pandemic has created new costs and reduced state revenues. Um, what would you set as your priorities? I, I think right now we just have to use the, the, whatever money is to create a healthy environment uh, for staff, teachers, everybody who's involved. That's, that's what has to be prioritized at this time. Okay, thank you. Ms. Delba. Okay, my mute button got stuck. I think that um, we need to utilize our CARES funding, but I think we need to also look into some of the funding that current school districts have. I, I know it's almost like robbing Peter to pay Paul in certain school districts. And so I think right now we need to focus on our safety and then co still continue with their education because the education is still, is still the, the only and main priority. Um, we have this going on around us, but we still have to somehow find a way to stay focused on the prize. And that is making sure that these students are educated throughout the school year. Um, they've already lost so much over the last three months when the pandemic just hit us in March. And so it was almost really like pay, playing catch up at this point, trying to get people back into the groove, trying to get them focused on it. And so I think we need to learn to utilize the tools that we have 
to make sure that they stay educated and not fall off the grid. And Ms. Johnson. I think our priority should be, should be student safety. And we prioritize student safety by making sure that every child has a device to close this digital divide. We have to use the funding to pay for internet for the families so that students can be at home doing remote learning. They don't have to be forced to go into school because they don't have a computer. So I think that closing the digital divide should be the priority. And I equate that with student safety because when students have, when they all have the computers and the, and the internet, then we don't have to worry about, oh my goodness, they're not in school, they're not learning and so forth. So I think that that should be the, it should have been the priority a long time ago because students have been taking tests on computers, including kindergartners for a long time without having computers at home to be able to practice copying and pasting and so forth. So it should have been the priority a long time ago. Thank you. Um, Can I make a comment to that? Sure. Thank you. Um, I, I do agree that safety is important. However, we are also struggling. When you have the entire state on an internet, it is bound to crash. And we have been watching that happen over the last several weeks where students are not able to get on because it's being overwhelmed and the system is crashing and then there's no, no learning going on, which causes frustration for, for everyone involved, the parents, the students, the staff. But I do agree that safety is important, but we still have to be mindful that there's, it's not totally all worked out while we're trying to work that out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, final question. Um, and I'm going to do it a little differently here because um, for Ms. Johnson as the incumbent, there's a, it's a different question. Um, so I'll go to um, Ms. Alba first. Um, as a challenger, uh, what do you bring to the position that Ms. Johnson is not offering or um, how would you do a, a better job, do you feel, Ms. Alba? I Oh, I, I don't really, well, the wording of that question, because I don't want to put anyone down and say what they're doing or not doing. What I can bring to the table is my years of experience as being a board member, as being a parent, as being an advocate for students and parents, as well as teachers. Um, eight years being on the board constantly in Washington, D.C. and Columbus, advocating for our students in education <clears throat> and making sure that they receive um, so I, I cannot, you know, and I will not say what anyone is or not doing. Um, I can only speak for what I am able to do. Um, no one board member can act alone, that they do need the consensus that they to, to accomplish any goals at hand. And so my goal is to work with the board, the new board coming in, the state board, to ensure that all students in Ohio receive uh, education through this pandemic and after this pandemic and use my years of experience as being a board member, as being a PTO person, as being, um, uh, my background is mental health and alcohol and drug counseling to use all of those tools for social emotional learning to ensure that all students continue to be educated. Thank you, Ms. Alba. Mr. Neal, same question. I would bring, I'm a team player, I'm a collaborator, and I bring some leadership and integrity. That's what I bring to the table. All right. And Ms. Johnson, as the incumbent, what have you learned over the past four years um, that you believe you could do better or, or be more effective going forward? Well, my, during my second year, um, I've been trained in, in trauma-informed strategies and trauma has a, a huge effect on a child's ability to self-regulate and to learn. And during my second year, I did a tutorial with board members on trauma and how it affects the brain. Um, I, I think that, that my biggest accomplishment is having brought that conversation um, to, to the board and to ODE. Uh, it's now in our strategic plan. Uh, we talk about the trauma-informed strategies. We talk about uh, cultural competency. We're talking about the kinds of things that will help all children be successful. And I have really been a leader um, in that conversation. I think also my 40 years of teaching experience has provided the kind of um, information um, and the kind of insight that uh, the other board members just didn't have. 
um, until I got there. Um, I'm, I'm the only really K to 12 teacher. Um, that we have a higher, a couple of higher ed teachers. We have a superintendent, but as far as a K to eight, K to twelve uh, urban teacher, I'm the only one. And I, so I think that my experience in it alone um, has really helped. All right, we are up to uh, closing statements. Um, you will each have two minutes for a closing statement, and we will go in reverse order of the opening. So Ms. Johnson, and then Ms. Elda, and then Mr. Neely. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Okay, I want to first of all say thank you for this time. Uh, this is a very important position. The State Board of Education is really important, even though a lot of people don't know we have one. And so um, I, I promised myself I would not close without mentioning something that is the reason why we have so many school levies every year, and that is House Bill 920. Uh, House Bill 920 was passed in 1976, and what it does is it freezes a district's um, property tax, uh, the money it gets from property taxes, it freezes it at the level where that property tax was in the year the levy passed. So that means inflation, um, the money does not increase even though inflation is present. And so that's the reason why we have to keep having levies. It's not the for fault of the, of the school board. And um, as far as I'm concerned, it's not the fault of the school districts. It's because of how schools are funded as because of House Bill 920. So I just want to say that I would like to return to the board, especially to continue the work with our racial justice resolution. Um, it is, uh, you can find it on the homepage of the Ohio Department of Education. And one of the things that states in the resolution is that we will do some self-reflection. And last month we started our implicit bias training of state board, school board members. I found out today that we're one of the few states that is doing this. There were 15 states in a meeting today and they were amazed that we had moved ahead with the resolution and implicit bias training. And so I'm excited about the work we're doing. I want us to continue to take a look at the curriculum to the standards and what's going on as far as making sure that our students are learning the truth about America, which um, to know that all of them have had uh, some participation in this country and that we, we stop leaving out the true story of what, how this country came to be. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ms. Zelda. So I, I like to thank you for this hour of question and answer. Um, I just want people to remember that I do have experience as being on a school board, um, eight years, eight years and two years of leadership. Um, I am a former e-board member for SE1199, um, SE SEIU 1199. I am a delegate, so I am on the battlefield constantly for everyone. Um, my motto has always been education and students first. I just want us to continue the fight to make sure that um, children, all students receive education um, because just because you live in a certain area, people just assume that you have money and that you are are exempt from certain education and you're not. Everybody is in the same boat. Um, I just wanna make sure that we all move forward and making sure that we ensure that there's high educational expectations for all students and that all students can learn and that they will learn. And just once that we all continue to work together and be on the same page, I believe that that can happen. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Neal. I'd like to thank, uh, in closing here, thank everybody for their participation. It's very enlightening for me. Uh, and nice to meet you all as well, too, not officially, but officially, unofficially. So thank you. Um, as far as the educational system, I would like to get involved. From, I, I, me personally, I have a financial background, and I think that's the most important, one of the most important parts of uh, getting it, trying to get this financing proper. Uh, and I think that's a big part of it. And it, when you start making decisions, when you don't have money, you start making questionable decisions. So I think that's an important part of what we need to do. And that's part of the reason I would like to get involved. I've been in a district where we, up till this past year, we were passing a levy every year. We probably had four or five years every continuous. So I think that's a big, important part for me that's a big part of it. And I think it'll make the educational part of this it, a lot easier once you don't have to worry about financial stuff. So that's, uh, that's, the, that's the bottom line for me as well too. Is, and the education of a kid is just utterly important. I have two granddaughters and 
love them to death and I hope they do well. And, and I think they'll do well too. So I hope everybody can do well, all kids. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. This concludes our candidate forum for District 11 of the Ohio State Board of Education in 2020. I would like to thank our volunteers who made this evening possible, to thank our attendees who logged in, and most of all, I would like to thank our three candidates because without candidates, we don't have government. So thank you for your willingness to serve. Everybody, don't forget to vote on or before November 3rd. Thank Thanks you. Thanks everyone. Take care. Thank a great you. evening. Thank you very night. much. Take, Take care, care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.